This is lecture number one in our blood vessels and blood pressure series. Our learning objectives are to talk about this thing called peripheral resistance and how that contributes to blood pressure. And we want to look at this thing called the Frank-Starling mechanism and the Bainbridge reflex. Um, I, the next few slides are actually just a point of review, just to kind of... Um, kind of get us situated here. Remember that the cardiovascular control centers lives inside the medulla and there's sources of input into the cardiovascular control centers, which we've looked at before. And then there's output from the cardiovascular control centers um, through autonomic neurons. And those things can um, influence cardiac output in various ways. But what I want you to see here is that they can also influence blood vessels. And what, it, what, what they do to blood vessels is that they impact the, uh, the diameter. The smooth muscle around the blood vessels can be impacted so that they can vasoconstrict or vasodilate. Um, basically making the lumen smaller in the case of vasoconstriction or making the lumen bigger in the case of vasodilation. And so these, again, are a result of integration through the cardiovascular control centers and then autonomic output to the blood vessels. Um, we've seen stuff like this already. We've looked at baroreceptors and how those might impact blood pressure. Remember that baroreceptors are monitoring pressure here in the carotid sinus as well as the aortic arch. That input goes into the cardiovascular control center and then we do something about it. So what is this, um, I don't wanna rehash the baroreceptor response here, but what I'm, I put this here to remind you that when you have an output here and whether we're gonna impact um, heart rate here through the SA node or AV node um, or contractility through the ventricular myocardium, either way, both of those are gonna increase, either one of those alone or certainly both of those acting collectively is gonna increase cardiac output. And when you increase cardiac output, naturally you're gonna actually increase uh, blood pressure. Okay, uh, this is another slide which should be a point of review at this point, looking at the vagus nerve coming down here, the SA node and AV node, and sympathetic neurons then going to SA node, AV node, and the ventricular myocardium. So again, just as a reminder, does that mean the parasympathetic has no input onto contractility? And it's not quite true, is it? Um, it has no direct input on contractility because you don't see direct innervation from the vagus nerve to the ventricular myocardium, but... Is there an indirect effect on contractility? Certainly, because you know already from what you know about the nervous system that when the parasympathetic nervous system is talking, there is a descending input that's going to actively inhibit sympathetic output as well too. All right, so because of that, there will be an indirect output of the parasympathetics onto ventricular myocardium, even though there's no direct vagal innervation. So now then, so again, all of that is kind of a, should be a review to you guys. And that brings us here then into blood pressure directly. When we look at blood pressure, one of the variables that we talk about is this notion of peripheral resistance. And what I do want to say is that as peripheral resistance goes up, blood pressure goes up. One more time, as peripheral resistance goes up, blood pressure itself will go up. So what we have here is a conversation about just peripheral resistance. Again, I, I, I do want to, I, I, it'll be the third time I say it, but I want to emphasize it. As peripheral resistance goes up, blood pressure goes up, okay? So now the question then becomes, what are the components of peripheral resistance? Well, when you look at this, um, the, there's been some very good work done on this, and we have this mathematical equation showing us these are the contributors to peripheral resistance. So let's look at the fraction here, and we, if we break down the fraction kind of methodically into the numerator and the denominator, we'll talk about each of those. Um, again, it's in your interest to recall, though, that if the numerator alone goes up and there's no change in the denominator, remember the total value of the fraction goes up. In other words, if any of these numerator values go up with no change down here in the denominator, then peripheral resistance will go up. On the other hand, you remember from kind of from you know grade school or middle school math, if the denominator itself goes up without any change in the numerator, then the value of the overall fraction, the overall value of the fraction goes down, and so peripheral resistance will go down. Okay, if that seems a little bit confusing, then just pause the video and just remind yourself um, of how fractions work. I, I, I don't mean to be insulting or anything, but if you've not worked with fractions in a while, it can be a little bit confusing just throwing out words like numerator, denominator, this goes up and the value goes down. So, you know, just take a number like one half and compare it to one third and just talk about what's happening in the numerator versus denominator and what that means for the overall value of the fraction. Okay, now with that said, let's look at the numerator. When you look at the numerator, we've got the number eight here. We've got L for length. And this Greek symbol eta, E-T-A, eta, that's this funky looking N thing, that is a symbol for viscosity. So let's talk about each of those things. So peripheral resistance, now there's a, there's a fellow that figured this out a long time ago, and this applies to, to any system out there, not just blood vessels, 
But, you know, the number eight is a constant, so we'll leave that alone. Length, what does that mean? It means that as the length of a system increases, let me, let me say piping then. As the length of piping increases, the greater resistance you have. In, in some ways, you can think about it this way. You know, if you remember the old days where, you know, maybe you did something like this, is that you made little spitballs, right? So you have a straw here, and I remember doing this all the time at, at fast food restaurants and things like that. I, I guess that was a little bit obnoxious, but it was just my way, I suppose, when I was younger. So you get a straw and then a wad of napkin or paper or something, and you kind of wet it, and then you... You, you spit it out and you hit somebody in the, in the shoulder or in the face or whatever. And so again, this if you consider this, this is the length of a pipe. Let's just call that, I don't know, three inches. Well, if I increase the length of this pipe from three inches to six inches, then is it easier or harder to force that spitball out? You would say, well, obviously it's going to be harder to force the spit. I'm assuming it starts at the same spot. It's going to be harder to force that spitball out. Why? Because you've got greater length of pipe and it offers more resistance to the movement of that spit of this wad of paper. So that wad of paper initially starting here and it's migrating through and the longer the pipe is, the more wall I have to scrape against, for example. So therefore, the longer it is, the more resistance there is to the movement of the spitball. Okay, and this is what this is telling us, and we know that it to be true in blood vessels as well too. The greater the length of your blood vessels, the more resistance those blood vessels are offering as a whole to the to the movement of blood, and so there there's there's that. Um, the next thing is viscosity, and so what is viscosity? Viscosity is kind of a, it's resistance to flow. You, we can kind of loosely describe it as like the thickness of a tissue uh, of of a, of a fluid. I, I I shouldn't have said tissue. I mean of a fluid. Um, and so how can we think of that? Well, let's say, let me go back to my spitball example. Let's, let's go look at this picture again. Where'd you go? There's my picture. All right. And so when you look at this picture, let's say it's not a spitball, but it's just water in that, in that straw. And now you're blowing out water over at somebody and the water, psh, it flies out. Um, on the other hand, now let's say you got it, the, the straw itself has some maple syrup in it instead. And so like a really thick, goopy maple syrup or honey or something like that, it's much more viscous. It's thicker. Same question. Is it easier or harder to force that honey out onto you know your target um, compared to just water? Well, you know that it's going to be harder. It just makes more sense. It's a much more viscous, uh, a thicker fluid. There's more resistance to flow. And so what we see here, um, darn it, I, I think I moved my PowerPoint. Give me just a second. Okay, there we go. And so what this is showing us is that as viscosity goes up, resistance goes up and therefore pressure, blood pressure will go up as well too. So now, before we move in the denominator, let, let's talk about that. What am I really saying? I'm saying the longer your blood vessels grow, or, or I shouldn't say grow, the longer your blood vessels are, then the more peripheral resistance you have. Now, let me just make up a number, okay? Let me just say, I, I know the number is estimated out there, but I don't know what it is in my head. I don't feel like Googling it right now. And so let's just say that we've got 100 miles of blood vessels located within your body, okay? I'm just making up that number. You get 100 miles. That's the length of your blood vessels. What that means then, again, is your heart and, and, and some other mechanisms is promoting the movement of blood through 100 miles of blood vessels. That is your length. Now, what happens if the length of your blood vessels goes from 100 to, let's say, 130 miles all of a sudden? Then we would say, whoa, there's a lot more peripheral resistance at this point. There's a lot more piping that we need to go through, um, and that's going to lead to an increase in pressure because resistance has gone up. So then the question is, well, does that ever really happen? So again, let's stick with that number 100 miles. And the answer is, well, yeah, sometimes it happens. Let's say, you know, something happens in your life and you got really busy and your life falls apart. And all of a sudden, in the course of a year, you've just put on 100 pounds now, okay? You put on 100 pounds and there's there's massive amount of fat tissue that you just didn't have before. Well, guess what? That fat tissue is gonna become vascularized. So you're gonna literally grow more miles of blood vessels. And so the fancy name for that is angiogenesis, where we're just growing more blood vessels. But and as blood vessels increase in length, what happened to peripheral resistance? Whoa, it went way up. And that's going to be very, very likely contributed towards an increase in blood pressure from that point on. Now, obesity is its own issue. So there's other reasons to have an increase in blood pressure blood pressure, but I'm just trying to point out that in those situations, there is a meaningful increase in length in the blood vessels. Outside of that though, yeah, we're not really going to see 
you know, you, you guys need to have the ability to manipulate blood pressure. But when you want to manipulate blood pressure, you do not all of a sudden start growing new pipes. You don't start growing new blood vessels because you want blood pressure to go up. That's just not something that happens. Now, what about viscosity? Does your viscosity of blood ever change? Well, if it did, what would happen? Peripheral resistance would go up and therefore blood pressure would go up. But does it ever meaningfully change? Again, I would say for the most part, no, it's not going to change. Now, again, if you're severely dehydrated, then blood viscosity can increase to a meaningful degree. Um, the other thing is uh, you may have heard of people taking certain like performance enhancing drugs that increase the number of red blood cells like EPO. And when they do that, we might see if you're taking it to kind of a, to a crazy degree, then you may see an increase in viscosity as well. But under normal physiological circumstances, we do not manipulate viscosity in order to increase resistance and increase blood pressure. Just like under normal physiological circumstances, we don't manipulate blood vessel length to increase resistance and increase blood pressure. Okay, that's just not what we do. Okay, so what we're going to do then, we're going to assume that uh, under normal conditions, length is constant, viscosity is constant, eight, of course, is a constant. So we're going to change this equal sign to say just a proportional sign, and we're going to just kind of put the number one here just to have a constant up there. Okay, so that's how we have addressed the numerator. Length and viscosity can contribute to peripheral resistance, and in situations of pathology, they can contribute to increasing resistance, but in normal physiology, we're not going to actively manipulate these two variables. What goes below? Well, the number pi is a constant, so let's just drop the, the number pi. What do we have left? Radius. What do we mean by radius? Very simply, what radius means is that if we're peering into a blood vessel right now, again, this is the diameter of one blood vessel, this is the diameter of another blood vessel, and the one on the right over here clearly has a larger radius. Remember, radius is that distance from the center out to the, the edge or out to the, to the line. Uh, that makes the circle. And so this radius is clearly longer than this radius over here. And so what are we seeing then? As radius goes up, what happens to resistance? In other words, as radius here increases, right? What are we going to see happen to resistance? Well, as radius increases, that number is in the denominator. And what we'll actually see is peripheral resistance will drop. As radius goes up, peripheral resistance drops. Again, the number here is in the denominator. And so when that happens, blood pressure drops. To say it differently, when you vasodilate, okay, here's my normal blood vessel size, for example. There it is right over here. Let me delete that guy. Here's my normal blood vessel size. And now, for whatever reason, I'm going to vasodilate. And what I see is my blood vessel goes from there to there. When I do that, peripheral resistance drops and therefore blood pressure drops. What does that mean then in the opposite? What if here's my normal blood vessel and now what I do is I'm going to vasoconstrict. In vasoconstriction, I go from here to here. I made my blood vessel really small. I made it much smaller, the radius decreased in size. Well, when I decrease the resistance, I'm decreasing the value of the denominator, therefore the overall fraction will increase. To keep it simple, a decrease in radius will increase resistance. A decrease in radius will increase resistance, which increases blood pressure. Now, the last thing that I want to point out here with respect to this equation, I know we've been spending a lot of time on this slide because it's just kind of cool. This is math coming alive, is radius to the exponent four, radius to the fourth power. So why is that meaningful for us? What that means for us, because there's an exponent here, is that a small change in radius is going to lead to a dramatic change in resistance. One more time, I might only change my radius a little bit, but because that little bit, that magnitude change is amplified because it's powered, it's to the fourth power, and therefore the resistance will change a lot. To say it differently, look, ready? I'm going to vasodilate. Boom, I vasodilate. Okay, one more time. Ready, go. I vasodilated. I vasodilated only a little bit, but that led to a dramatic drop in blood pressure. Let's go the opposite way. I'm going to vasoconstrict. Here I go. Ready, boom. I vasoconstricted just a little bit, but that led to a massive increase in peripheral resistance and therefore blood pressure. Okay? All right. Now, the last two then, the Frank Starling, the last two learning objectives. The Frank Starling mechanism is this. Um, the cardiac stretching itself, if I increase the ventricular filling, if I increase venous return, meaning the blood return from the venous system back into the ventricles, if I increase that, I'm going to increase stroke volume. So why does that happen? Look, here's normal ventricular filling, and whatever I fill it up with is going to be the quantity that gets ejected. So if 70 milliliters is returned at any given window of time, then I'm going to eject from my ventricle 70 milliliters. On the other hand, if I have extra ventricular filling, due to an increased venous return through whatever mechanism. Okay, we can talk about that later, but let's just say there's an increased venous return. 
When that happens, there's extra blood now in the ventricles, 90 milliliters now. That stretches the walls of my ventricles, and what that's going to lead to is a reflex, the Frank Starling mechanism or the Frank Starling reflex that kicks in, where now I will eject more blood. So the Frank Starling mechanism tells us that whatever amount of blood is returned to the ventricle is the amount of blood that will be ejected by the ventricle. If you return a medium amount, you eject a medium amount. If you return a lot, you eject a lot. And that's because any stretch in that cardiac muscle, any stretch in that ventricular myocardium is going to lead to an increase in contractility. Okay, that's the Frank Starling mechanism. Um, you should consider what would happen if this didn't occur, if this reflex wasn't there. If I filled in with 90 and only ejected 70, and then 90 more comes in, and I only inject 70 more, and 90 more come in, and I only inject 70 more, then you can imagine what happens, right? I'm backing up the ventricles, right? I'm not sufficiently emptying the ventricles, and that is not good. The Bainbridge reflex then. Okay, hang on a second. So Frank Starling mechanism influences contractility. The next one is the Bainbridge reflex, and this influences heart rate. Remember again that heart rate and contractility these two things, um, contractility, again, contributing to stroke volume, these two things are going to help, uh, or, or not help, they're going to contribute to cardiac output. So let's look at the Bainbridge reflex. Here's what we see. We again see an increase in venous return. When I have an increase in venous return, I'm going to increase right atrial pressure. Seems to make good sense. Certain, uh, certain atrial receptors are stimulated, and that's going to kick in this Bainbridge reflex, which is saying, hey, SA node, we need a little bit more from you. And so what we're going to see is that you're going to see an increase in heart rate. Okay, so that increase in heart rate, that's what that plus sign is showing. Um, that increased cardiac output, uh, sorry, the uh, that increased right atrial pressure, of course, is going to increase cardiac output. And when you increase cardiac output, you increase atrial pressure, which is going to kick in a baroreceptor reflex, which is going to actually calm down the heart. So we see these two different kinds of um, influences upon the heart. Again, it should be nothing new to us to see opposing voices telling some end organ what to do. We've seen that all throughout physiology thus far. Um, this is how feedback loops are set up. Um, but for right now, what I want you to see is that an increased venous return is going to increase heart rate. That is the Bainbridge reflex. Um, so ultimately, what do we see? Increased venous return, increased heart rate, increased venous return here, increased contractility, which is stroke, which will lead to stroke volume changes, and so therefore cardiac output increases. All right. Uh, how does peripheral resistance contribute to blood pressure? That was this slide over here, which we spent enough time talking about. And then we described the Frank Starling mechanism and the Bainbridge reflex. And that wraps it up for lecture number one.